book of James. We're going to continue our series that we began uh, several weeks ago through the book of James. and um, In fact, this is the sixth sermon we've preached through it. We're almost through chapter one. Uh, we'll get there. But we're going to start and pick up where we left off last week in, in James chapter one, verse 21. And what we're going to see today as we go through this text is we're going to see James uh, continuing to be specific with how we should live our lives. In fact, we're going we're gonna to see how uh, in order for us to live out our faith as Christians, we need to be immersed in the Word of God. The powerful, life-transforming Word of God. In fact, we're going to see as people of faith that we can't just be doers or hearers of the Word. We have to be doers of the Word. That as we're people of faith, we do the Word of God. We do the things that God tells us to do. So we're going to pick it up in, in James chapter 1, verse 21, where it says this, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and the overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted Word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the Word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the Word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Let's pray together. Father, we're grateful for the gift of today, and God, I thank you for this opportunity I have to stand in front of this congregation and to herald your message. God, I pray for your wisdom. I pray that the word that I bring today would not be mine, that it would be yours. I pray that I've rightly divided this word of truth, and God, I pray that, that through this message, through the songs that we sing, through the prayers that we pray, that God, you would be glorified. God, I pray for each and every one of us in, te in this house today to come to an intimate encounter with You. That we might bow down before Your grace and thank You for Your blessings and that we may feel Your presence in our lives. God, we pray for Your Holy Spirit to be upon our hearts, to illumine our hearts that we might understand the message that You've given us today in Scripture. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, today's text begins with a transition word, the word therefore. And a little clue we use when we do Bible study, whether you're doing it on your own, whether you're teaching a class, whether you're preaching or you're in a small group, whenever you see the word therefore, you've got to ask yourself a question. What's it there for? Because it's a transition. It means because of something. Because of something, that's what James is going to lay out next. And if we go to verse 20... We see that James was talking about the righteousness of God. Remember last week we talked about being swift to listen, being slow to speak and slow to wrath because the wrath of man does not bring about or produce the righteousness of God. That we should strive to be righteous people. We should strive to live according to His precepts, according to His laws, according to what He would have us do. And it's from this thought that James transitions. He says, because God desires righteousness, therefore, lay aside all filthiness and the overflow of wickedness. Because God desires righteousness, we should lay aside all filthiness and all wickedness. Now, if you were to read a different translation of the Bible, if you were to read from the New International Version, uh, it translates this as, therefore, get rid of all moral filth, and the evil that is so prevalent in the world. Now James wrote this 2,000 years ago. So apparently there was a problem in the ancient church. 2,000 years ago, apparently existed a world where there was evil run rampant, where there was moral filthiness, where there was an overflow of wickedness. Now I'm just thankful that today, 2,000 years later, surely we've overcome that, right? There's no moral filth out there. There's no wickedness, right? We're good. No, that's not true at all. If anything, I think you could make the argument that we've regressed. But either way, God's Word is timeless. God's Word is absolutely timeless. There is moral filth and wickedness. And as Christians, what we see in this verse is that we need to choose to distance ourselves from that wickedness. Now I want to talk about this, this filthiness, this wickedness that is, that is everywhere we look, folks, because I think we, have a, we live in a very dangerous world. 
where there's so much of this sin, <coughs> so much of this wickedness, this filthiness, that I think we've become somewhat numb to it. It's everywhere we look. It's on televisions. It's in magazines. It's on the products that we buy. They can, they can make anything filthy. Advertisers will use whatever sells their products, right? Whatever sells, they're going to use to push their products. And you know what they use? They use sex. If we're going to be honest about it, try to find a commercial that has not been sexualized. I mean, they have products out there for, for liquid Drano. Have you seen the Drano commercial? The new Drano commercial? Guys, they found a way to make cleaning pipes filthy. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, I'm not even going to go into it here. But it's on television. You'll see it. Now, it's on everything we look, everything we look at. Let me give you an example. My wife, she went through a phase where she was a crazy coupon lady. Has everybody seen the crazy coupon ladies on TV? They have binders where they just collect these coupons. It was great, and she did a wonderful job stocking up on all sorts of stuff. You could, she'd find a deal on soap, or she'd find a deal on shaving cream, deodorant, whatever it was, and she'd collect as many coupons as she could. That was a good coupon. Wait for that item to go on sale, and then she'd buy as much of it as she could. And we'd have stockpiles of stuff all over my house of random things. Well, I got a body wash one day. I got a body wash. And on the back of the, and I'm going, if you don't believe me, I got it here. You can see it afterwards. I brought it with me. There's little cartoons on here you can see, right? I don't know if you can see it from there, not close up, not in detail. But it's a picture of a guy in the shower. Right? Just a stick figure, nothing illicit, anything like that. A guy just cleaning himself. And right next to it, there's a cartoon with a, a woman in a skimpy dress kind of beckoning him. Saying, come here. And, and the caption of it says, the cleaner you are, the dirtier you'll get. Unlimited female attention. <laughs> it's on soap! They have found a way to put filthiness in soap. And folks, we don't even realize it. We laugh, and, it, and, it, and it's, a, it's kind of funny to think about. But man, it's everywhere we look. What about the television shows we watch, the movies we watch? I used to watch a show called Grey's Anatomy. Grey's Anatomy has probably every sin known to man at some point in that show. And i, I got to admit, this is not the first time I've used this, uh, this sermon illustration. I, I've used it before. But I was preparing for a sermon, not this one. And I was watching Grey's, Grey's Anatomy was playing on the television and I had my Bible open and I was making some notes, just going through, through some things. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm watching a show and I'm finding enjoyment and I'm laughing and I'm going along with the very things that nailed Jesus Christ to a cross. I smile and find enjoyment and pleasure in watching things that grieve the very heart of God. And folks, that shouldn't be so. That should break our hearts. Because we do it all the time. And I think that the world is so, so fallen that we've become numb to it. We don't even realize what's happening right in front of our eyes. The, the things that we just take for granted grieve the heart of God. And James tells us right here, because God demands righteousness, therefore lay aside all filthiness and the overflow of wickedness. We should distance ourselves from those things that are unholy. Now I'm not saying that the body wash bottle that I just held up is evil in and of itself. I'm not saying that company's evil. I'm saying recognize filth when you see it. And distance yourself from it. Choose to set that aside and lay aside all that filthiness and wickedness. Now one of the things I love about James, as James writes his letter, he tells you this is a problem, this is a problem, this is a problem. But he doesn't just leave you there. He says this is how you fix it. Because God demands righteousness, we should <coughs> set aside, excuse me, 
Set aside, lay aside all filthiness and receive with meekness the implanted Word which is able to save your souls. See folks, as we read through this text, we not only see that as Christians we should be running away from sin, setting aside, separating ourselves from sin, but we must turn to and submit to the authority of God's Word. We've got to turn away from sin and turn towards the authority of God's Word. It says, Receive with meekness the implanted Word, which is able to save your soul. To receive something is to accept it or to take possession of it. And with meekness, to do that is to do that humbly or submissively. A willful obedience, a willful acceptance of something. So translated... Or put into layman's terms, what James is saying here is that we're to accept, humbly accept and submissively accept the implanted Word of God which is able to save your souls. So I want to talk a minute about the Word. About the Word of God that he's talking about because we talked about this a little bit last week. <coughs> the power of words. And we began with hearing and listening to the power of God's words. And then we went on to talk about our own words and the power and the weight that they carry. But we're talking about God's Word today. And the power of, of God's Word, it has the power to give life. God's Word is life-giving. It has been from the very beginning, even when He spoke it in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27 says this, Then God said, and God said, He used His Word, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. By His words. He said, let there be and there was. Let us make and we did. God's Word is life-giving both here on earth and eternally. Because God brings forth and the Word of God brings forth new life. Not only just life as it exists here on this earth, but He brings forth new life. 1 Peter 1.23 says this, as Peter's talking about the early church, talking about Christians, he says, You've been born again, <coughs> not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the Word of God which lives and abides forever. It is through the Word that we're saved. Now you may be asking yourself, well, is it the Word that saves us or is it Jesus that saves us? Well, Jesus was the one who did the work. But we wouldn't know about Jesus without the Word, would we? Because the Bible tells us exactly who Jesus is. The Bible tells us what Jesus has done. It is the Word that leads us to Jesus. And not only does the Word of God bring life, but the Word of God is truth. The Word of God tells us what's right and what's wrong. The Word of God tells us what is righteous and just and what is not. The Word of God tells us what is holy and what is unholy. The Word of God tells us completely everything we need to know to be righteous. Our Lord Jesus is recorded in the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verse 17, as saying this, Sanctify them by your truth. Your Word is truth. So as we submit to the authority of God's Word, we need to be mindful of that. God's Word is true. Always has been, always will be. He means what He says, and He says what He means. And that Word here, God's Word is described as implanted. James uses the word implanted to describe the Word of God. So let's talk about what it means to be implanted. That is, thank you, I love you, When we plant something, we plant a seed and it grows, doesn't it? The implanted Word of God is His gift to believers. He gives it to us to write onto our hearts and to grow. So the Word of God may grow inside of us that we may grow closer to Him through His Word by studying the Scriptures, by studying the teachings of Jesus Christ. By diving into the Word, we get to grow in our faith in Him. And eventually, we grow so much in our faith that it overflows. Just like that overflow of wickedness comes from filthiness, an overflow of righteousness will come from living out the Word of God. 
that will grow so much that it will be on the outside that we can share it with others and implant it in them. Plant the seed with those around us sharing the gospel and watching what the gospel will do in the lives of others. It's the implanted word and we've got to submit to the authority of God's word. Folks, when we move on to verse 22, we see something else. It says, But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourself. Be a doer of the word. And, and, and I want to share this thought. <laughs> it is possible. In fact, a lot of us do this. We hear without doing. But you know what's impossible? To do without hearing. It is very possible. We can hear the Word of God and not do what it says. But we can never do what God wants and do His will without listening to what it is that He has to say to us. We have to take the time to listen to it. He's given it to us. Several years ago for Christmas, my wife and I bought our daughters loft beds for Christmas. We bought them these loft beds and we bought them off the internet and they came to us in boxes. Big boxes, they were metal loft beds. So I was taking it on Christmas Day. We had our big Christmas breakfast like we always do. and I unpacked this box and I was getting ready to assemble one. And, and the instructions are right there in front of you. In fact, in big bold letters right on the front of the instructions says this. Read entire assembly instructions before attempting to assemble this product. Well, folks, I'm a man. I got a picture, I can put it together. I took those instructions and said, I don't need instructions. I got me a picture. I'm going to go ahead and put these beds together. I did. I got my tools out. I laid everything out for two hours. I tried to put those, that bed together. Every time I think I'd have it, I'd be missing a piece or I couldn't pull it apart enough to quite get it to fit together. And my wife, God bless her, kept coming up. You've got the instructions. Why don't you use them? I don't need no instructions. I'm good. Eventually, I needed instructions. Once I did, it took about 20 minutes. I wasted a lot of Christmas afternoon putting those, those beds together. But folks, so many of us are like that in our faith. God's given us His Word. It's all right here. Everything He desires for us. If we would just hear it and we would do it. He doesn't make us do it. He gives us a choice. He doesn't, we're not puppets on a string. He doesn't say, here's my word, I'm going to go ahead and implant it in you. He says, man, I'm going to give you a gift. All you've got to do is accept it. So it's up to us. James writes, we're to be doers of the word. We are to exist as someone who performs, or a doer is somebody who performs or executes something. Someone who carries out instructions. That is a doer. Somebody who does something. As doers of the word, that means... That we should be a person who exists, exists to live our lives in obedience to the biblical truths that God has given us. To be a doer of the Word means to actually do what it says. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine if we did this? We'd change the world, wouldn't we? If we actually did what the Bible told us to do. It's simple. It says be a doer of the Word, not a hearer only. Now that doesn't mean that hearing's not important, does it? We talked a great deal last week about the virtue of hearing, getting the whole story. We talked about being quick to listen, swift to listen. And we began that by listening to God. That was the first example I gave. When we should listen, we should always listen first and foremost. We should listen to God. We do need to hear what He has to say to us, but it doesn't stop with hearing. It's not enough simply to hear it. If we're going to be and live a Christ-like existence like God calls us to as believers, then we need to take the time to hear what God has, us to, has to say to us. We've got to hear it. And then we've got to act on it. You can hear without doing, but you cannot do without hearing. Psalm 119.105 says this, Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light to my path. God has illumined for us and lit up the way that He wants us to go. We've got to choose to live it out. 
And there's a promise that comes when we're faithful to that. There's a promise that comes when we're doers of the Word, when we do what it says and we live lives that are pleasing to God. God gives a promise when He gives His Word because in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11, God says this, My Word that comes from My mouth will not return to Me empty, but it will accomplish what I please and will prosper in what I send it to do. God's Word will transform lives. His written Word has a purpose. Our Bibles have a purpose and that purpose is to point us to Jesus Christ. From the very beginning to the very end, everything that's in here points us to Christ. And when we hear and we do the Word of God, we accomplish exactly what God set out for us to do when He gave us His Word. Jesus says in John chapter 5, verse 39, You search the Scriptures, for in them you think they have eternal life. And these are they which testify of Me. Folks, as we get down to it and we talk about faith doing the Word, being hearers and being doers, as we do the things that it lays out for us in the Bible, we come to know Jesus Christ. Always have, always will. That's God's purpose. It's really quite simple. It's the basics, isn't it? Vince Lombardi was a... Yeah, I'm sure you all know Vince Lombardi. He was a, a legendary coach for the Green Bay Packers. Legendary coach. Had a lot of success. And his main focus as a football coach was discipline and execution. Getting to the basics. In fact, one of the things that Vince Lombardi is famous for is he would every year at the preseason, at the first gathering of his football team, grown men who were so good at football that they got paid to play the game. They played it for a long time. And Vince Lombardi would stand in front of his players for the first time every year and he'd say, gentlemen, we're going to get back to basics. This is a football. And he'd hold up a football for these grown professional football players. Then he'd take them outside and they'd walk around the football field and he'd explain what out of bounds was. He'd show them the goal line. Now you can't argue with results, folks, because his teams got results. His teams could tell you, we're going to run a power sweep to the right, try to stop us, and most defenses couldn't stop them. They were that good at the basics, that good at execution, that they were unstoppable. Well, folks, I think James is telling us the same thing. It's time to get back to basics as a church. This is our Bible. This is our Bible. In it is the life-changing Word of God. The message contained in the pages of this book has the power to transform you from something lost to something found. Has the power to transform you into exactly the person that God has created you to be. Why? Because every passage in this book points to Jesus Christ. The Savior of the world. The Lord of all. And as we have a time of commitment this morning, that's what I want for us to commit to do as a church. is to commit to spend time being doers of the Word, which means we need to hear the Word. Will you commit to spending time daily in your Bible? God has given you this Bible. He's given you the ability to read. He's chosen to communicate to you in unmistakable ways through the words contained on the pages of our Bibles. Folks, as we have a time of response, I invite you to examine your hearts. Maybe you need to make a commitment because you feel like you're a hearer and not necessarily a doer. Maybe you need to commit to be more biblical in your approach to your life. Maybe you need to be a more biblical husband or a biblical wife. Or to discover what God would have to say to you about raising your children. Or about a message that God would have you live out in your lives with your parents, with your sisters, with your brothers, with your co-workers. Folks, if we're called to be doers of the Word, we've got to hear it first. It's not enough to get your Bible from me on Sunday mornings, guys. <laughs> No preacher's that good. God's given you His Word for a reason. And He's given you His Holy Spirit 
that you can understand the words and, and, and the message contained in the pages of Scripture? Will you commit to getting into the Word each and every day? And it'll transform your life. Folks, we're going to have a time of, of invitation, a time of response. And if God has spoken to you today about becoming a Christian for the first time and that's something you feel led you need to do, let me pray with you about that. Maybe He's, he's prodding you to join this church, a Bible-believing church. And if that's a decision you need to make, come forward. Let me celebrate that with you. Maybe He's put something else on you. Maybe you've heard the Word your whole life and He's pressed upon your heart today that it's time to live out the truth that you've learned your whole life right here in church, right here in the Bible. And if you need to make that commitment, pray about that. Make that commitment. His Word will fulfill the purposes that God has sent out for. And if we would let His Word speak to our hearts, He'll transform us into exactly who He wants us to be. Let's pray together. Father, we're grateful for the gift of today. God, I'm thankful for each and every person here. I'm thankful for Your Word. And God, I pray for the strength to be a doer of Your Word. I pray that I would have the strength, whether popular or unpopular, whether comfortable or uncomfortable, to live out Your truth for my life. God, I pray that I'd be bold in my conviction. And God, I pray that each and every one of us would be bold in our convictions in Your truth. God, I pray for Your Spirit to be upon us that, that we might be obedient to You wherever You'd lead us. Help us to fully trust who You are as Lord of our lives. We love You and we thank You for it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.